to help us uh, with these topics, uh, we're pleased to welcome uh, two experts. Uh, so my Brookings colleague, Mark uh, Murrow, is here. Uh, Mark is a senior fellow in Metropolitan Policy, and he's written extensively on manufacturing and the digital economy uh, in uh, particular. And then also joining us is Terry Babcock uh, Lumish, who's president of Islay Consulting. Uh, she's covered a number of topics related to manufacturing, technology innovation, and uh, workforce uh, development. So, uh, Mark, we'll start with you. Uh, what's your general view of the vitality of U.S. Uh, manufacturing amidst the current economic boom? Well, I uh, just want to first shout out to John White for yearly supporting the, these great dialogues, and to you, Daryl, for including me in this, and I uh, want to shout out to your work, which I think has been instrumental in really pushing the technology story right into the manufacturing and production story. And great, great job on the, the, the uh, scorecard. I mean, to your question, I agree with, I think, some of the sentiment of the last panel, especially Sri and our McKinsey friends, that, you know, this is an ambiguous moment for manufacturing. Uh, it's a complicated juncture. There's genuine momentum. There really is. Um, on the positive side, we see favorable ratings, like as in your index, but also, uh, you know, uh, growth really at its fastest pace since the crisis. Uh, I don't think people quite realize that, uh, you know, there was a surge in, in manufacturing right after the uh, crisis through the recovery. There's a kind of trough. And we, we have uh, manufacturing now over the last 18 months actually adding jobs at 1.7% a year, output 3.6%. So there's genuine uh, uh, traction in the sector now. Uh, uh, and then I would say the game is coming to the U.S., really, as Industry 4.0 becomes the main template in the world. Uh, new design and simulation tools, automation, IoT, data, all the things that... Uh, Daryl writes about in his book, and we've been hearing about uh, machine learning, as they pervade factories, that's really, in theory, very good for the United States. That's a huge plus. The U.S., uh, uh, it's a, nine of the top ten top grossing uh, software as a service firms in the world are American. This is an American specialization. So, in a way, uh, in theory, this should be a advantage for the United States, a, a deep set advantage going forward. Uh, this is our stuff. This is our technology in many respects. Um, I have to say I'm a bit concerned though. Performance is spotty in the sector. Uh, it hasn't really uh, been as good a manufacturing resonance, uh, renaissance as the meme has suggested. Uh, Output growth, uh, as McKinsey and Rob Atkinson have shown, is not that impressive when you take out things like computers, pharmaceuticals, and medical devices. Basic consumer goods production has seen declines. Uh, and in general, it's extremely variable performance. About half of the 86 manufacturing industries we analyzed uh, recently have had positive productivity growth, just half. And most of those were barely positive. Uh, and, and then we've done work on the digital content of industries, the digital adoption of industries. If you look at it, uh, advanced manufacturing looks OK, uh, middling on its adoption of digital technologies. But basic goods manufacturing, pretty anemic. You know, It's not fully uh, adopting these technologies and therefore has relatively low productivity uh, and growth. Um, so, meanwhile, uh, McKinsey's found that 400 manufacturers in a survey ha half had no digital strategy. Uh, I think that's a problem. And meanwhile, uh, for the anxiety about robot use that I think uh, Daryl talks about so well, robot use is actually lower in the United States than in many other nations, you know. And I would say, I would contend that's not a good thing. Uh, uh, so, seems like we're maybe missing an opportunity here. Uh, I've been a big promoter or pro uh, advocate of manufacturing's importance, contra to Barry's very thoughtful 
dissent on the last, uh, I do think it's special, I do think it's important, but here we are, the dominant IT economy in the world, and yet we are clearly not the dominant leading IT user in this very important sector that is special. So the result is spotty performance, weak SMEs, and only okay group growth. I think we need to get with the program, so to speak. Uh, and if we do, I think there's a potential for a, a lasting repositioning of this sector. It's something different. It wouldn't be our parents, but it could be a very formidable uh, uh, sector. So, I, you know, that's my mixed big upside, but some concerns about uh, drift right now. Okay. Uh, so, Terry, uh, I know you study changes in business models and technology innovation. So, what new models are emerging and how are the technologies and business models outstripping public policy? Sure. I'm actually going to dovetail on your introduction, Mark, and um, maybe going to just ground it given your metropolitan studies yeah, uh, expertise great. in a very local story. Um, so, to provide a little bit of personal background, I grew up with the name Terry in the 1970s <laughs> in Pittsburgh. The heyday of the public steel, uh, the Pittsburgh yeah, Steelers. Right. Uh, I was destined to become a great little quarterback. I became an economist. <laughs> that being said, our school field trips were to coal mines, to steel mills, factories. Okay, so this is a very near and dear story uh, to my heart. I haven't lived in Pittsburgh in some years, but when cut with blunt objects, I still bleed black and gold. Okay. <laughs> Um, I mentioned this to say that I'm very sympathetic to this nostal nostalgic hearkening back to the heyday of manufacturing of yesteryear. That being said, when we look at Pittsburgh today, we can look at a number of different sectors, all connected to manufacturing. So as we look at ICT and robotics, will we see wonderful things largely coming out of Carnegie Mellon? When we think about biotech, mm -hmm. lots going on that's really exciting out of UPMC. Um, if we want to talk about the giant production mills, I remember the, the, the smokestacks when I was a kid. Well, we still make things, but they're largely reuse stories connected to sustainability. We see mini mills instead. If we want to talk about green jobs, there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, we look at the production of PVs, um, photovoltaics, uh, solar cells. This is doubled when it comes to volume, productivity, output, approximately every two years in the last decade. So when I think about my hometown, our sky looks different, our skyline looks different. But that being said, as we're still making things, we're doing it very differently. So those business models, the way technology is outstripping policy and the business models and the workplace um, norms that we know, that's where there's an exciting discussion to be had. Okay. Uh, so, Mark, I know you uh, look at geographic disparities in the digital economy and has uh, published some uh, outstanding reports uh, that are all available at uh, brookings.edu. Uh, uh, how big of an issue are these disparities? Uh, how can we overcome them? Uh, what, which, what should we do about the laggard areas? Yeah, a couple of things. So, first, I... I th uh, my mantra about digital technologies, I think we're winding up talking about how digital is changing uh, uh, manufacturing. Digital economies have, I think, a twofold uh, effect. On the one hand, they empower people, firms, industries, uh, and I'm going to say places. You know, the, these are very powerful uh, technologies that can open up new magnifying uh, uh, dynamics, but I think that there's something inherent in digital technologies that because it maximizes or amplifies inputs, it amplifies divergence. And so left to their own devices, I think that digital technologies create larger uh, variation among places, and you do get this pull away effect of certain places. I think for manufacturing, uh, there are greater benefits because more of it is place-based. So I think that the digital technologies can give more places, in that sense, an opportunity to participate in global supply chains. And I think 
so I think on balance in manufacturing technology and IT uh, may allow you know the empowerment of more regions and so and to that extent I think we have a new uh, revaluating re revaluation of places in the Midwest places not on the coast that can participate at a very sophisticated level through IT in global supply chains uh, and and that can begin to counter some of the the uh, variation we see. One of the most important things is for some of those regions to build up deeper ecosystems. I think they have been emptying out and technology can allow different business models, different ways of operating in a smaller, uh, more remote place. Uh, I'm, I think we're going to see the emergence of a kind of technology powered, software driven technology uh, manufacturing firm that looks a little more like a tech firm. It may be five people with a laptop ordering up certain, you know, contract manufacturing and manufacturing uh, that way, connecting to global markets. And so it may, manufacturing may begin to move towards smaller units that can operate in Wichita or, a, you know, small town in, in Ohio as opposed to a big town connected to a big network. Okay, uh, and I agree with uh, Mark. There are tremendous opportunities uh, in the Midwest and uh, Rocky Mountain uh, states and uh, South. Uh, but one of the concerns I have is when you look at venture capital investments yeah. now, three quarters of those investments are going to three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. And so to the extent that VC investment predicts future economic activity uh, and uh, economic uh, growth, my concern is those patterns are going to lead to greater disparities, uh, not reduced uh, disparities. Hmm. Now, Terry, I know you look at uh, geography in international uh, manufacturing. So uh, what are we seeing uh, there? Uh, what are the uh, differences uh, across uh, regions and how is it affecting supply chains? Sure. Um, so by way of background, um, you know, I've worked at Treasury and CEA and I love looking at our 2D metrics. And I think we have some wonderful metrics that are very helpful to us. But in the interest of full disclosure, I am an economic geographer, meaning I'm interested in, in the spatial allocation, distribution, um, and agglomeration of economic activities around the world. Go geography. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. I, know, I, I worry you just lost our audience with this. <laughs> Basically, geography is not dead. I think for many of us who grew up memorizing capitals and countries, there's much, much more to it. And basically, what that means is I'm interested in these clusters. As you, as you speak to the, the potential inequalities around VC, that's the kind of thing that gets me going. Likewise, when it comes to how it is we look at supply chains around the world, and the nexus of where economic activity is happening and how it is we respond to incentives and what is it we do, what do we build, how do we source things. These are the kinds of things, especially as I'm guessing at some point we're gonna jump into the tariff discussion because I think each panel certainly has. Um, these are the kinds of things I'm very interested in. So I just shared this to say, I think there's a really easy assumption that we've made that we have been on this very linear and continual path to increasing globalization. And what I would say is we need to complicate that narrative. And I think whether we like it or not, we have. And so without a doubt, because there has been this path dependency, there are some materials that we can only get from certain places or we've lost the ability to source things anywhere beyond where we've continued to um, look for things. Now that being said, we do find ourselves at this very interesting inflection point. Whether we look at these tit for tat tariffs or whether we look at what's happening around concerns with respect to fuel prices or emissions, that I think it's actually important when we look at this big macro story sure. for what's going on with trade, we actually need to become experts in each of those micro streams because the reality is there might be very real incentive to reshoring. In some cases, those uh, far field or far flung international supply chains from cradle to grave, absolutely make good sense. Great. <laughs> but the reality is, and this is where when we talk about some of these interesting technologies or new business models, just take additive manufacturing. And I'll put it in the context of biotech. It's really exciting to think about the potential of bone transplants, organ transplants. If you have additive manufacturing that allows you to manufacture a kidney, a liver, mm. a femur, 
you're not necessarily ever interested in sourcing that from South Korea, where we do have a lot of <laughs> robotic density. You have very real reason to have that happen very close. So for each and every one of these uh, products, we're probably going to have to think a little bit more carefully about some of these disruptions with the technologies for what that supply chain might look like. So I want to get into the policy aspects of uh, this, and each of you have uh, mentioned some aspects of this in terms of uh, tariff policy, uh, taxes, uh, work, workforce development, and uh, education. Uh, what should we be doing public policy-wise in order to promote manufacturing? Mark? I mean, I would just, so, and one of, the, I think, I love your discussion of the power of local things to t determine outcomes, right? And, and I would say, like, the first one are pools of the right kinds of talent with strong face-to-face -face interactions and shared perspectives. And uh, so right off, I think that tells us that nations and states should be building up, you know, pools of, you know, not just general talent, but I would say especially uh, manufacturing relevant talent, which is increasingly digitally, did, uh, that fusion of digital and production. So I think that that's one of the most important first things is how does state policy support great, uh, uh, great uh, universities, important uh, great community colleges that are connected to local supply chains and understand uh, what is needed from them and what they're, they're and who they're producing, and then Things like uh, uh, a valuing of exposure to digital and experiential learning in K-12 seems really important. Uh, so place the first thing almost is building up that pool of, of manufacturing and really technology-related uh, uh, talent in places, and I think States and states and communities have a lot of influence on that. So in a global world, those turn out to matter a lot to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Terry, your thoughts on policy? Yeah, Paul's so ideas. I would absolutely agree with that. Um, I would actually go so far as to say I think we need to fundamentally re-imagine uh, yeah. our educational system. I, I think we're actually doing ourselves a great folly by <laughs> assuming that this human capital investment model that we've had, our parents have had, our grandparents have had, where we're going K through 12, we're going to undergrad, we're staying in school yeah. longer, we know the right. stats. Um, I really think that that's kind of a broken system at this point. And, and Daryl, in your book, you speak to this discussion of lifelong learning, and I think that's spot on. The idea that in literally around the world, we see great examples of people investing in education, of countries investing in education. But if you're taking people up that mountain only just to drop them off the other side because the jobs aren't there, or as these technologies are changing, as our economy is changing, that we, I believe the first panel was speaking to this idea that some of the jobs, I shouldn't say some, many of the jobs that we're gonna see in 2030 and 2050, we don't even know the names of yet. So the sheer idea that we should assume that we have invested in our brains up until age 22 or 26, <laughs> or whatever it might be, and then we're good to go, well no, we're not done and dusted. I think we need to really be looking, and this is through the community college system, but also for many firms, retraining, upskilling is an opportunity yeah. for recruitment and retention. And so this isn't just an American story, but literally around the world to be thinking about education as a lifelong process rather than just something we're investing in at the front end and then assume that we're going to be able to be critical thinkers or resilient enough to be able to respond to the twists and turns as we go throughout our, our lives and careers, I think we really need to kind of rethink this. And here I think there's a whole world of, that I think t we've learned about through uh, tech boot camps and so on, which are just one form of experiential learning, but also accelerated learning of smaller, uh, extremely targeted bits of knowledge that can be delivered not in four years or not in two years, but in three months mm -hmm. to help someone be able to carry out a role in a local manufacturing uh, uh, or technology operation. I think that's some of 
where this will need to go. And so we, we have these big mainframe educational institutions that are going to need to, you know, begin to disaggregate into different delivery mechanisms that are smaller, faster, leaner. Uh, does that make sense to you? Yeah, I would absolutely uh, agree. Yeah. I think dovetailing on your, your mentioning of inequality earlier, yeah. I think these kinds of boot camps or uh, yeah. upscaling, retraining opportunities can actually fill in a lot of these gaps. And we have some examples of this, not just in the US, yeah. but around the world. Um, Northern Kentucky is actually a great example. Um, so I believe it was in 2014, there was a program uh, called Raise the Floor. And they recognized they had this very real um, skills gap. There was demand for manufacturing, and they found that they weren't getting the labor that was skilled that they needed. Well, there also was a very high rate of poverty, specifically around right. single moms. Well, why were they not applying? Why were they not getting into uh, this space? Well, it wasn't just the education. It wasn't just the economic opportunity. It was a much more multivariate problem. There are transport issues. There are child care issues. Well, it was actually really nice that decision makers in the community recognized that, hey, we can cobble together this opportunity that was going to meet the needs of women who very much wanted these jobs. They were seeking the training to get them, but they also realized that they needed some place to help ensure that their kids were going to be safe when they were at work. Well, what did they do? They not only trained the women, but their kids, they were getting excited about STEM at younger and younger ages. You know, it was something that was actually beneficial for the whole of the community, not just for that particular firm that was looking to hire. So each of you have mentioned uh, workforce uh, development, uh, lifelong uh, learning, and just uh, as our economy is going through this digital uh, transition, yeah. the need to uh, retrain workers. And of course, uh, Takeo has been a leader in this uh, area through its uh, learning center and courses that it offers its uh, employees. So what should businesses be doing? Uh, what is the role of government uh, in this? How should we think about this important idea about workforce redevelopment? I mean, it's funny, I was just going to add again to your great comment and call out some of what John is doing within his firm. I mean, it's clear, I think historically, and we heard from Barry that, you know, uh, incumbent training by firms will always be underinvested because the workers leave. I think not only because we're in a tight labor market, but because the switching costs are devastating to firms. Uh, that we may, we're, and I think there's evidence that we're beginning to see more firms beginning to think of their organization being a lifelong or learning organization, that itself is needing to change, and that maybe it's best to do a significant amount of that with your own workers. So I would add, you know, incumbent training, such as John has, you know, been, uh, you know, pioneered really in Rhode Island, uh, really investing in your own workers as, an, as, a, as your primary way of learning as a company and changing as a company is central. Uh, so will that just happen? No, I think it's clearly, uh, it, it would be good to add uh, uh, greater incentives for training uh, if it's the number one input. Um, we have an R&D tax credit. Uh, there's been discussions, why shouldn't certain kinds of education be part of the R&D uh, 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 process or simply uh, stronger incentives for uh, uh, companies to train since it's of state interest, it's of national interest. So I think this is one thing more organizations may begin to look like John's in this sense. Uh, so I, I agree that this is an absolutely crucial area. Yep. Terry, your thoughts on workforce retraining? Sure. Um, um, again, I'm just going to continue to dovetail on this. We have really wonderful performance evidence domestically yeah. and internationally that mm -hmm. by investing in one's workforce, you wind up having greater productivity and less turnover. Mm -hmm. When you have... Um, firms that are really switching from being uh, shareholder focused to stakeholder focused. Yeah. I don't say this just to sound Pollyannish. I mean, the, the, the evidence is there, the stats are there. Um, Morgan Stanley's Institute for Sustainable Investing has done some wonderful work looking at the full anatomy of a firm. And so when you consider 
again, from cradle to grave, how it is you're sourcing. People want mm -hmm. to know that they are buying when they have the choice. If they can um, um, make a choice between a product that they believe is sustainably sourced and they believe when it comes to environmental standards, labor standards, things that they want to align their values with their shopping preferences with, they're going to choose that product. Now that goes not just in terms of the external consumer facing uh, decision, but also internally. So when you look at governance of a firm, when you look at how um, uh, benefits uh, are, are, are uh, designed, the reality is that each and every different, again, anatomy or tentacle of a firm, given just how far reaching our multinational firms are, or even our local companies are, when given the opportunity to make a decision with each and every sourcing decision, each and every hiring decision, firms with greater diversity, firms that invest in their people, firms that care about where their products are sourced, and when it comes to design for disassembly, what happens after you're done with it? Those are the kinds of firms that we want to invest in, and like it or not, the numbers bear out. And you could imagine a, a division of labor. If we're thinking that incumbent training by companies of their own workers is really important, well, what should the rest of the education system be doing? You know, one of, one of that may be uh, a more practically oriented education uh, that includes experiential components, uh, you know, chances for uh, internships and co-ops seem like a natural way of supporting individual firms. And this was especially valuable and workable, I think, in manufacturing. Uh, in Kentucky, the FAME network, uh, I think it's uh, with uh, Honda, has built up a very impressive, like, you know, interactions with K-12, interactions with the community college, but then also with independent certifications that's just imbuing the whole region and can really support what their a big company is doing. So I think that all of this is extremely uh, crucial. And to the extent that K-12 gets better at helping people have a modicum of digital exposure, whether it's you know a computer science track, which I think we, everything we're hearing about manufacturing suggests that a degree of not necessarily coding, but uh, you know experience around and comfort around uh, digital machinery is extremely important. And so it seems like that's one of the new literacies that supports a company like uh, like Tyco. Uh, so, last question is on infrastructure, then I want to get some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and so we've heard uh, uh, lots of different discussion on the earlier uh, panels about infrastructure, different models of doing it. W what do each of you uh, recommend in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of how we should think about it, uh, what are the best uh, ways to handle the uh, investment, public-private partnerships, and uh, so on? Mark? Um, well, first, uh, on type, we should make sure uh, that we assume that digital infrastructure is assumed part of the national industry, uh, infrastructure discussion. It isn't always. Uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Adi Tomer and, and Joe Kane, have done some great work showing not only is, are there bigger gaps in the broadband coverage uh, than we may assume, but sometimes that the whole importance of this is left out of the, the national discussion of infrastructure. Uh, I do think that uh, a, a fusion of national uh, institutions and especially evaluation data and benchmarking combined with strong uh, you know, state and local uh, delivery and, and collaborations is the way to go on, on this. Uh, uh, I, th I think it's crucially important and, uh, and it and clearly should be mapped into economic needs of the country, uh, you know, and, and uh, clearly manufacturing is one of the central uh, areas that you would want to be uh, uh, looking at. Terry, your thoughts on infrastructure development? Yeah, I, I was also going to begin. I promise we didn't coordinate this in advance. I was also <laughs> no. going to begin with the discussion of digital divide because the reality is we have some amazing potential. If you look at, um, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, my goodness, we've been able to leapfrog over laying fiber optic cable. The connectivity and the potential 
that we have, whether it's connecting smallholder farmers to markets or for telemedicine, yeah. we can't underestimate. That being said, right here in the U.S., I mean, I think we've all had the experiences of knowing exactly where that's, those, those cell gaps are as we drive um, or, or make our way in our commutes, perhaps. And so I really think when it comes to looking at how it is that we are addressing a lot of those digital gaps, that is absolutely mission critical. In terms of infrastructure, oh goodness, you know, having spent time in Japan and to have people apologize when a train leaves a couple seconds early or a couple seconds late, I mean, that is just remarkable. There's no reason why we shouldn't be firing on all cylinders there. When it comes to, goodness, Liberia, um, with a recent Ebola crisis. Anyone who spent time in Sub-Saharan Africa knows the feeling of being jostled around in a van for hours on end. Well, where is it that you find the smoothest, nicest road in Liberia? Well, it's Chinese built. <laughs> so when it comes to infrastructure, and I don't mean this just for the US, I mean internationally, there is absolutely no reason why we aren't using this time as we have this resurgence to be investing in. Um, and I don't mean to be Pollyannish about this, at a time when we have incredible partisan uh, tension and divisiveness, there is no reason why this is a partisan issue, whether it's investing in uh, our roads, our rail, um, our, our, our airports, trains, digital connectivity broadly, uh, physical and um, you know, pixels. Uh, it's just something that is long overdue. And I would, you, I mentioned, would just uh, the, you mentioned the issue about the uh, cell phone gaps, and I used to visit my mother <laughs> in rural Ohio, and she was like <laughs> right in the middle of this dead spot. I could go 10 miles north of where she lived, 10 miles south of where she lived, and get a signal, but not where she lived. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, and, and, and the, the mapping I mentioned really shows that there are surprising gaps, you know, close, even close to metropolitan areas. The one thing I would add, too, well, I think that much of this delivery needs to happen at the state, local level, where there's proximity to to industries and and uh, uh, you know local consensus. I do think we need it to overlay a some kind of infrastructure bank or some kind of data-driven, analytics-driven uh, uh, actor to to make sure that we're funding those absolutely crucial nationally significant links, whether it's you know, critical port gaps, you know, fix, uh, fixing critical ports, uh, airports, big ticket items that clearly add up to a national you know, network. We need to make sure that we're, you know, uh, you know, fun, you know, have a structure that can deliver on that as well. Okay, uh, let's open the floor to questions. Uh, there's a couple questions there, so we'll start with the uh, woman and then uh, go from there. And if you can give us your uh, name and organization. Sure, my name is Suzanne Bergeron. I'm with the National Urban League. Uh, I, we do a lot of, we have community-based affiliates around the country that do the, the, the partnership and the connecting for training, uh, preparing people for uh, credentialing and connecting them to the, the workforce, but I, we don't hear that role of that cadre of service providers. We hear community colleges mentioned, and I'm wondering why that's not given the visibility that it should be given. By giving them more visibility, you're giving them more access and more opportunity to get the funding to be able to continue to do the service. We service populations that are the hardest to serve. The young um, 18 to 24 who have been disconnected from school and dropouts, well, we make it work for them. And so, you know, we have STEM programs and we, you know, we don't hear, uh, we serve primarily the African American community. We also serve uh, Latino and Hispanic communities. You have cadres of community-based organizations like that in different populations. And if we can just elevate them to be part of the partnership uh, that's being discussed. Uh, so I wanted to raise that question and bring that to your attention. Secondly, on the, on the infrastructure, the National Urban League has been pushing hard to make sure that in the discussions that we have uh, minority businesses in the supply chain as well as in the construction, local hire provisions, um, and building infrastructure not just on the roads and bridges but the schools and the community centers. So if you could comment on that as well. Thank you. 
So Susanna, I would thank you for the work that you're doing, and I'm not going to disagree with you. <laughs> I think we need more good news stories about some of these um, public-private independent sector partnerships that are working together to fill some of these gaps. So you speak to the work that you're doing. There are 17 other programs that I think any of us could, could rattle off that just make us feel better that uh, there are these kinds of partnerships. Does that make the headlines? No, unfortunately not, but I think the fact that you're here sharing that with people is great. I think there's also, uh, I think it's an interesting moment where the big tech companies are quite motivated right now to try to support inclusion, you know, for lots of reasons, including some of the mm -hmm. critiques they've uh, been on the receiving end. So I think we're beginning to see the, the I, I know Google and Microsoft each have quite, you know, well thought out uh, uh, basically courses and online uh, tools that can be linked with local uh, and, and used by uh, uh, local nonprofits or others to, you know, really inculcate some of those first level tech skills. And I think all of this then can feed into, you know, what I think is, is one of the really uh, innovative, creative, uh, uh, areas of experimentation around the boot camps and code schools, and I think they, and they can be for other exposures, but this focus on uh, short, uh, intense, uh, and super relevant uh, course, coursework. And all the better if, like as in St. Louis, where uh, uh, a, an organization called Launch Code actually provides this kind of training for free by making sure that it can place people, that it gets paid for, uh, so it works as a placement. So it's a great bridge between these kind of initial exposures, then moving into higher level skills, and then being able to be placed and, and not have to pay for the work up front. So I think that we're, we, we now have a bunch of really interesting models and it's about scaling them up in a lot of places. So I, I really appreciate the work you're doing here. And I'll just add a quick uh, footnote on the uh, training uh, front, which is I think as we move forward in the next 10 to 20 years, there's going to be significant workforce disruption just from the various yeah. new technologies that are coming online, changes in business models and the like. There's going to be more than enough work to do. We're going to have to need the best efforts of all of these kinds of organizations. So certainly the types of uh, things you're uh, talking about are going to be absolutely crucial. Community colleges are going to play a very active role uh, for first generation students, for uh, immigrants, for poor people. Uh, community colleges often are the educational uh, system of choice uh, for them. Uh, and so they need to kind of align what they're doing with the business community so that their students have the requisite skills. And then companies themselves are going to have to mm -hmm. really think seriously about uh, worker retraining. Uh, AT&T is an example of a company on a large scale that has been doing a really good job of this. Uh, they're taking entry level uh, workers and giving them additional skills so they can uh, uh, progress up the line uh, within uh, their company. Uh, in the very back, there was somebody who had a question on the end. Yeah, right behind you, there's a microphone coming up. I'm glad, <coughs> pardon me, that you're mentioning uh, Can you some give your the... uh, name and organization? Oh, my name is Alice Ortusar, and I run the Holistic Medicine Information Clearinghouse, the Well Mind Association of Greater Washington, and I'm a researcher, writer, and editor and I've edited and proofread standardized tests, and it really sickened me to see literature reduced to multiple choice questions. So uh, I'm encouraged to hear about these opportunities offered in education. And I'm wondering about models we used to have. It, I, I was trained by Kaiser. The ad said EKG technician needed will train in the 1970s. I knew other companies that had very strong training programs as long as they felt that you were capable of being trained, of learning. And I'm wondering what has happened to that? Companies seem more interested in pursuing H2B visas to bring in workers with skills and pay them less than they would pay American workers. And I also remember models such as the Chicago Vocational High School in my town 
that had state-of-the-art training after the sophomore year of high school for any student who felt that was the direction he or she wanted to go in. And they came out market ready, job ready, with state-of-the-art skills. So we've had these models, and it seems businesses are reluctant today to make those investments and prefer to look abroad and bring people in rather than actually training and then retaining the workers with additional incentives. I mean, I agree. I think uh, there are traditional models that perhaps we do need to go back to, and vocational education I would certainly put in that category. I don't think every uh, high school graduate needs to go to college. Uh, we need plumbers, electricians, uh, people who have uh, good design uh, skills. And so having a strong vocational track for people who don't want to go to a, a two or four year university, I think makes a lot of sense just so we make sure we have uh, the skills uh, that we're going to need. Uh, this gentleman here has a question. There's a microphone coming over. Thank you, Sandy Apgar, CSIS. Uh, we know how to design vocational education. Uh, we collectively are around the globe. We know how to design PhD programs in hundreds of disciplines. How do we design a lifelong learning system when we don't know the outcomes, when the pace of innovation and the scope that you've been describing this morning is so vast, so rapid, that the nature of the learning itself is a quest. Um, I think this is a truly vexing pedagogical problem, uh, but it's also a very practical policy problem since we're investing heavily. I mean, I don't think this is an area where a top-down solution is appropriate because in a situation where there's going to be a lot of disruption, people's skill needs and training needs are going to vary quite a bit. So in my book, one of the ideas I suggest is to give the ordinary person the power to determine uh, the retraining. So I developed the idea of uh, lifetime uh, learning accounts. It's kind of like an uh, IRA or a 401k uh, program in which people can put money in on a tax advantage basis. Uh, perhaps their employer could uh, match that. And then as that person... Uh, sees a need for additional uh, 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 job skill development at age 30, 35, 40, or uh, whenever, that person makes the choice to draw on that account, and it could be for an online class or certificate program. There may be a specific skill uh, that individual needs, but it gives the person the power to decide uh, what the need is going to be. I, I think that type of very bottom-up, very decentralized, and very individualistic based type of system is the best way to go. And it and it's adapted or anticipates or assumes unpredictability. It predict it assumes continuousness. It, it assumes that you don't just educate yourself once, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and it assumes that you won't be taken care of necessarily by each of your employers, <coughs> that you better buy these services. So we, and we think, yeah, I, we really agree on this. And, and uh, I think it's, it would be ideal if governments would match or, or, or uh, the kind of deposits into a lifelong learning account uh, because there is a national or, and or state interest in people being able to adapt, being able to constantly learn. So I think, I think this is one of the key ideas that we really need to be thinking about in the next few years. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just pile on. I mean, the yeah. reality is we don't live in this William White organization man <laughs> era anymore. And so whether we're talking about the portability of yeah. uh, benefits with respect to pensions, with respect to lifelong learning, yeah. I mean, we just need to be reconfiguring uh, all of the above. What I'm going to say specifically, though, with respect to any one of our, our um, institutions of higher education, I happen to think the most interesting things at most any college or university are not happening within disciplinary silos. They're at the intersection. So when you look at mm -hmm. um, you know, the sustainability work at ASU, when you look at some of the enterprise and the environment efforts coming out of Oxford, we could look at a number of different schools, community colleges, um, or uh, uh, you know, four-year universities, 
oftentimes if you're wanting to find some of the most interesting things, they're the inter interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, the MIT Media Lab is actively anti-disciplinary. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the interesting things are happening. And yes, I mean, the intellectual sort of like nerdy geek in me just thinks that's cool. But the reality is, as you speak to assuming a lifelong trajectory that requires intellectual creativity and intellectual curiosity, well, getting comfortable with discomfort, getting comfortable with having to think critically of not knowing the answers, and rote memorization isn't gonna help us, but recognizing that we are at this interesting inflection point in our economy and America's role in the world, being able to be resilient and adapt from not just job to job, but career to career is going to be essential. Uh, by the way, Terry, being a nerd at Brookings is okay. Like we think yeah. that is a term of endearment. Thank you. Uh, nerd I think we have, safe space. Yeah. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Is there a gentleman back there? Or uh, we can go over here. Uh, here's a microphone for you. Uh, Gene Allen, um, retired, but I'm president of the MIT alumni in the area, and one of the key things we're working on is the future of work and what it means and where we're going. Uh, most of my career has been technology to use techno you know, commercial. Actually, can, can you hold the microphone up a bit? Work, working technology issues to make sure we have economic opportunity. One of the key features of training individuals is having mentors, and mentors from the family level, K through 12 teachers who are mentors to their students, not just rot teachers, mentors as, as peers. Having a, a promoting mentorship, I think, is one of the key capabilities that made me successful in, in any event. And I think I have trouble finding mentors. My kids have trouble finding mentors, particularly in technology-centric areas. I don't find a lot of people really qualified, uh, and I'm spoiled in the nuclear Navy, so qualification really means knowing what you're doing. Uh, what can be done to incentivize and promote mentorship to enable individual learning? Okay, that's a great closing question. Mark or Terry? Yeah, I mean, and that's an interesting thought. It's easier to, have to think of a system to provide mentors when the knowledge is sort of sta static and backward looking and more like you know, less, less changeable. Uh, I, I, I do think we're seeing a lot of experimentation. I mean, uh, uh, there are lots of great university and community colleges that are working to Make, build this into every you know course. I think this is part of why uh, apprenticeships and co-ops are really gaining traction because there is the opportunity to to have some connection with with someone. I do think we do have to find a way to really to scale up, make it easier to organize. I think these need to be regional, uh, you know, and local. Uh, you know, mentorship kinds of networks. There are a few, uh, I think the state of Michigan is trying to actually, you know, support regional uh, trade associations to do this work. So I think it's, you know, I, th I, think, I think your question is, is excellent about this. It's how do, but who, what is a mentor in a time of really radical change? Uh, I think maybe it becomes even more important. I noticed, I think, John, did you have a, did you want to comment? I think I saw you. Can I make one comment? Yes. And can we get the uh, microphone up? I don't need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but they but you do well with me. But you cameras, do. Cameras but you and do, microphones and Johnny Wicks. But you do for our web audience. So. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to um, circle back and come to something quite basic. Uh, for, for, for the record, um, and I've listened to all of these panels, and the, the discussions have been marvelous. For the record, I'm a true believer uh, in my heart of the value of manufacturing in America. Uh, from my experience and what I've learned in my life uh, is that unless something's changed recently, I don't think there's a greater creator of wealth than manufacturing. Uh, so I think it's worth preserving, growing, and developing. I wanted to share a story, which I sh I've shared on this panel before, 
Uh, but I, when we talk about education, I've heard a lot about education today and community colleges and the role of government and all, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this notion of intersection is really spot on. Uh, there is a company, and I don't remember where it was. It was Minnesota or North Dakota or someplace uh, a few years back that was all the town had and employed most of the town. And with this baby boomer uh, rollover, which is, hap by the way, a very real thing, because my, my average employment at TACO is 23 or 24 years. Right? But now that we all rose up in the same boat on the same tide, and we're all sort of now, well, I'm not rolling out, but a lot of other people are. And um, so what do you do about that? And this company, which supplied parts to the automotive industry, uh, was having to close their doors and move to Mexico because they couldn't get no employees to backfill. So they went to the town. They, they figured out a, a strategy, which I think is quite brilliant. Uh, they brought high school students into the factory because these high school students were told by their parents, you're not going into manufacturing. It's dark, it's dirty, it's hard work, right? Well, anything good is hard work. Right? So uh, they brought these kids in who saw what happens on a manufacturing floor today. And I can attest to this. It's not robotic, but it's pretty uh, video game-ish if you're in that generation. And these kids went home and told their parents, I want to work there. And the parents said, you can't. Well, they, then they brought the parents in with the kids. And the parents now saw what current manufacturing looks like. And in discussing it, they, they convinced the parents, and not every kid, unless a kid's going to become a doctor or a lawyer, or something, not every kid needs to go to college or wants to, but they feel obligated to. So this company began bringing these high school kids in after they graduated, paid them sixty or $70,000 a year to work on the manufacturing floor, and oh, guess what? They provided their continued education. So in the end of the day, these kids were employed, earning, saved the company in that town, and were educated. There's a downside to that. Uh, we, we provide education for our employees up through an MBA program on, on site. We have found in the last five or six years that folks take advantage of that, which is great, become f further educated and get their MBA, <laughs> and then leave. You know, so it's, there is a there is a uh, now we have to work on retention programs, right? But but I just want to put one last word in on behalf of manufacturing because I think it's a damn good thing, and I think we should be proud that we do so well in this country, and people like me are going to make sure we continue. Okay, uh, thank you. That is a great benediction on, uh, benediction on this uh, session. I want to thank uh, Mark and Terry for sharing uh, their views, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming out. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.